Welcome to Justice Trek. My name is Ted Kilvington, and this is an audio and video log that journeys through comic book history as I discuss individual comic book stories of Star Trek, the Justice Society, and the world's greatest superheroes, the Justice League of America. Justice Trek is the only show devoted to the entirety of these great comic book series. From the 1940 debut of the JSA, the launch of the JLA and Star Trek comic books in the 1960s, and right up to comics hot off today's shelves. This show will impact you in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Hey, I'm Ted Killington. Welcome to Justice Trek. Uh, in today's episode, we are going to talk about 1980s Star Trek numbers 2 and number 3 from Marvel Comics, the second and third parts of the adaptation of the film Star Trek The Motion Picture. I already covered, uh, this is episode 6 overall of Justice Trek, and in episode 4, I covered uh, the first part from Star Trek number one, Marvel 1980. And in the, our, that episode is available for you to watch, listen, and enjoy. And we also have uh, episode five, where I covered the first appearance of the Justice League of America from 1959's The Brave and the Bold, number 28. So, um, just a, a couple quick references. Um, my review copies for this issue uh, or these issues, excuse me. I do have uh, the original uh, issues. These are not the one, this is not the Star Trek number two that I bought at the time. Uh, that one, now I'll talk more about it later, but these are ones that I bought off eBay uh, a couple years ago. I also have uh, these two issues in reprint form in volume 13 of the Eagle Moss Star Trek Graphic Novel Collection. Okay. Uh, I did read Star Trek number two at the time it was published in February of 1980. Uh, and um, uh, the reason why we're covering issues two and three right after issue one, basically my plan for covering Star Trek comics is I want to do a gold key comic and then I want to do a uh, Comic, Star Trek comic from the 80s, and then F, but we're going to cover an entire story, so not just a single issue. We want to cover a single story. So if that issue or that story takes place over multiple issues, I'm going to cover the complete story before I move on to another story. And then so I'll do a story, a gold key story, a 1980 story, and then I'll do a Star Trek story from the present. So I will be covering Star Trek number 400 in a future episode shortly. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Now, um, since in episode four, when I talked about this, I already covered a lot of the, the background of Star Trek, uh, both where it was originally and where it was at the time of the motion picture slash this comic. So I'm not going to get into a lot of background info on Star Trek. If you want more background info, info on Star Trek, you can watch episode two where I covered Gold Key Star Trek number one from 1967. Watch episode four, or I guess I guess you could look it up, but I mean, come on. Why, why, would you, why would you want to do research on your own when you can just take my word for it? All right. Uh, characters appearing uh, in these two issues who have already appeared in our coverage of 1980 Star Trek comics are... Commander Spock, Lieutenant Commander Hikaru Sulu, Acting Captain James T. Kirk, Lieutenant Ailea, Lieutenant Commander Niyata Uhura, uh, Lieutenant Pavel Chekhov, Acting Commander Willard Decker, and Commander Dr. Leonard McCoy. Uh, characters appearing in this issue who are making their first appearance in our, my coverage of 1980 Star Trek comics. Uh, that would be Lieutenant Dr. Christine Chappell, created by Gene Roddenberry, made her first appearance on uh, Star Trek, the original series, uh, Season 1, Episode 4, The Naked Time, which aired September 29, 1966. 
This also marks the first appearance of uh, Christine Chapel as a doctor, since at, during the entire original series, she was Nurse Chapel. So just a, a quick little catch you up on where we were after uh, the first part of the adaptation. Uh, in the previous issue, a powerful and mysterious destructive phenomenon was making its way through the galaxy and was rapidly heading its way towards Earth. With the Enterprise being the only starship within range, Starfleet chose Admiral Kirk to retake command of the ship from Captain Decker with both men taking a temporary grade reduction. In addition to those two, the bridge crew also included Lieutenant Commander Uhura, Lieutenant Commander Sulu, Lieutenant Chekhov, and Lieutenant Ilea. Ilea is a member of the Zeltan race, and she has, um... <laughs> yes, she does. That's my kitten, by the way. She likes to make appearances in the episode. She's jealous of you folks. She wish I was spending more time with her than with you, but believe me, I spend plenty of time with her throughout the day. My wife is jealous of the amount of time that Kitten gets to spend with me. Uh, Lieutenant Ilea is a member of the Delton race, and she has some, perhaps, uh, telepathic or empathic powers. So, um, the ship's mission was to intercept the phenomenon and it, destroy it, if necessary, before it reached Earth. Um, that would be difficult uh, since all previous starships and space stations were easily destroyed by the menace. Uh, before the Enterprise made contact with the phenomenon, the ship did stop to take on board one former crew member, Mr. Spock. And that's where the previous issue ended. Star Trek number two was published February 2nd, 1980 by Marvel Comics with a 40 US cent cover price and a May cover date. The story was titled V'ger, 18 pages by Mar Wolfman, writer editor, Dave Cockrum, pencil artist, Klaus Jansen, ink artist, Marie Severin, colorist, John Costanza, letterer, and Jim Shooter, consulting editor. This issue is the second of three parts of the adaptation of the film. The film had a story by Alan Dean Foster and Gene Roddenberry with a screenplay by Robert Livingston. Mr. Spock steps foot on the bridge of the Enterprise where he is greeted by Captain Kirk. Spock asks to rejoin the crew and Kirk immediately reinstates both his rank of commander and his position as chief science officer. The previous chief science officer having died in a teleporter accident in the first part. Soon, the Enterprise approaches the phenomenon and the menace scans the Enterprise. Kirk orders the crew to not scan the phenomenon lest it be interpreted as an act of hostility. Previous Starfleet vessels had scanned the phenomenon and paid the price. After the scan, the phenomenon projects an energy field which disrupts the starship's electrical system, including a feedback burst which injures Lieutenant Chekhov. Mr. Spock notices that the phenomenon has attempted communication and returns a message of friendship. Soon the Enterprise approaches the cloud barrier at the outermost edges of the phenomenon and travels through it. The crew then notices that inside the cloud is a massive vessel, many, many, many times larger than the size of the Enterprise. The ship then enters a portal into the interior of the other vessel. When an energy probe emerges on the bridge, killing one crew member and transports Lieutenant Ilea away. The Enterprise is then grabbed by a tractor beam and pulled even further into the heart of the massive vessel. Kirk orders the crew not to fight back against the beam for fear of the ship being destroyed. Just then, they are alerted to an intruder in Lieutenant Ilea's quarters. Kirk, Spock, Decker, and McCoy enter the room to find another probe, this one taking the humanoid form of Lieutenant Ilea. The Ilea probe says it is there on behalf of V'ger, 
and that V'ger seeks to find its creator programmer. Dr. McCoy begins a thorough series of examinations of the ILEA probe, but the probe soon tires of the exams and seeks answers. Kirk orders Decker to deal with the ILEA probe, and while he is doing that, Mr. Spock secretly uses a Vulcan nerve pinch to knock one of the ship's crew unconscious. Okay, that was the uh, end of the second issue and the uh, second of three parts of the adaptation. The cover art to this issue was by Dave Cockrum and Klaus Jansen. Um, it, the cover shows a scene where uh, V'ger attacks the uh, bridge of the ship. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, on the cover, it looks like Kirk is being attacked, although that never actually happened in the story. Um, now, this cover did catch my 11-year-old eye, because as I mentioned earlier, I did buy this comic at the time. Of course, after having bought the first part of the story when it uh, appeared a month earlier, I definitely wanted uh, the rest of the story. Plus, I was uh, kind of new to whole comic collecting, and I was trying to get on the ground floor of series. So uh, already having gotten on the ground floor of uh, my first Marvel series, which was ROM, um, I wanted to do the same with Star Trek. Unfortunately, I never found issue number three until I got it off eBay a couple years ago. Uh, let's see. Um, now, the uh, first page is a splash image, uh, and it shows Spock making his entrance on the bridge. Uh, this was meant to be an important story break, uh, but uh, to me, it just seemed like it was about time that Spock rejoined the Enterprise crew. I mean... Come on, you know, if you are going with the original crew, you want the main players of the original crew, which includes Kirk and Spock. Um, and also on this page, for some reason, um, Kirk really looks off model. I don't know why um, that it, ha it happened since uh, all three issues had the same pencil and ink artist, but there was off a lot of scenes where the uh, uh, characters didn't see their, their look of the characters did not seem consistent even throughout. It's one thing to say that they should or shouldn't look like the actor who is portraying them on film, but it's an entirely different thing to not have them consistent within the own story. Uh, on page two, we, Spock assumes the post of chief science officer, but not for first officer because uh, Commander Decker is filling that role on this mission. Now, this is one of the very few, if not only times, that we ever see in, in film um, Mr. Spock not having some type of command position on the ship. Um, now, of course, in the original pilot, the cage, he was chief science officer, and then the uh, first officer was uh, um, known simply as number one. Um, but that, uh, that, I guess that would be the other time. I don't recall any other time um, when that happened. Uh, now... Also on this page, Dr. Chapel, who we see for the first time in the story, she's very happy to see Spock. Um, now, you folks who remember the original Star Trek series may recall that, uh, at least during the first season, um, uh, Christine Chapel was shown having uh, romantic feelings towards Mr. Spock. Um, I don't know why she had a romantic attraction to a Vulcan, um, but apparently some, some Earth women like Vulcans. I mean, Spock's mom was an Earth woman, so... Um, well, some women like guys who play hard to get. And I apologize if that sounds sexist. Uh, let's see. In fact, I apologize if it is sexist. Next up um, on page three, McCoy makes a comment about how the Vulcan race has no art or music or poetry. But Spock did display his musical talents using the Vulcan loot on more than one episode of the original series. On page four, a reference is made uh, to V'ger having 12th power energy. Now, this isn't really a scientific term. Uh, so I, I Googled it, the phrase, and the, the first couple of responses were actually just leading me back to this film. Um, but it, apparently, the base of the power scale is represented by 10 to the uh, zeroth power. Uh, and if I remember my high school math, uh, anything to the zero power is basically one. Uh, and in this case, um, one watt. 
So the base of the, of the power scale is one watt. Um, 10 to the 10th power is a gigawatt. And as you may recall from Back to the Future, uh, it takes 1.21 gigawatts to travel through time. Uh, the uh, 12th power, 10 to the 12th power, is a terawatt. And uh, according to Wikipedia, one terawatt is the approximate power consumption of the entire United States in the year 2005. So that's how much power uh, uh, Zulu was reading off of uh, V'ger in this story. Uh, let's see, page five, uh, Mr. Chekhov really looks off model on this panel where he gets injured, um, which is kind of odd because, uh, or sad really, because this is like the, the character's biggest scene in the film where he gets injured here. Uh, you know, the considering the length of the film, you think they could have had more time for um, the crew uh, besides uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, but that, as with the original series, uh, the other characters often got short shrift. Uh, let's see. Oh, page six. There's a lot of sciencing going on in this page, a lot of uh, the uh, technical jargon. Uh, sometimes the technical jargon on Star Trek was very real, very accurate. Sometimes it was, um, shall we say, speculative at best. Uh, and since I'm not a science guy, I, you know, uh, history was always my favorite subject. Um, the, I'm not going to get into the accuracy or lack thereof of a lot of the, the science concepts used on Star Trek. Uh, on page seven, uh, here we see that Viger received and understood the Enterprise's friendship message. And Mr. Spock observes that he sensed no emotion from Viger, only pure logic. It would seem to me that if uh, the Vulcan discipline is to reject emotion, that logic would merely be sensed by the absence of emotion. I mean, you know, you go through life and sometimes you just get, you know, those the vibes, you know, you just get a feeling that somebody likes or, or loathes you, you know, just their, their emotions about you are so intense that even if they don't say any words, you can just kind of feel it. Similarly, I would think um, that logic would more or less be the absence of that. I mean, I don't know how you could sense logic. I mean, there's no emotion in a rock. That doesn't mean the rock has logic. So I'm not really sure. So apparently you can sense a being and sense that it's sentient and is thinking but has no emotion. You know, a computer has logic, but it has no emotion. And, but it's not alive. You know, how do you tell a warm computer from a warm television set? Simply by trying to, uh, you know, gain, you know, by, by put, putting your hand on it. Can you tell which one, the computer monitor? And of course, the computer monitor, it, it, if it, you know, it's a separate piece. That's not what's thinking. It's the computer itself that's doing the, the logic. The, the monitor is just displaying the logic, but the logic, you know, just like my mouth is talking, and my brain is using the logic, such as it is. Um, now, so apparently, V'ger does have an immense psychic presence in the galaxy, but there is no emotion tied to that psychic presence. Page 8. They keep counting down the hours until the time V'ger will arrive at Earth. Given warp speed, much of this is moot, as V'ger can reach Earth almost momentarily, and once the Enterprise enters V'ger, the ship's own speed is irrelevant. Um, like, it doesn't matter how fast you're running on a plane. I mean, you run up and down the aisles as fast or as slowly as, or walk as slowly as you want, but you're not getting your destination any faster. Uh, page nine. Uh, this page is a lot of the uh, crew commenting in different ways about how large V'ger is. We get it. It's big and a big old ship. Can fit in many enterprises, bigger than uh, the star bases. Uh, let's see, page ten. Uh, there's an interesting drawing here. It shows what uh, V'ger is supposed to look like, um, and it looks to me like a giant eye. Uh, let's see. Uh, when V'ger sends an energy on page eleven, when V'ger sends an energy probe to the bridge, 
um, a couple of security officers, or at least one security officer, uh, tries to shoot the probe with a phaser, and then the probe, in turn, kills them. So when I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the bridge uh, crew is killed, it's because they're trying to, you know, attack Viger, and Viger doesn't like being attacked. Uh, page 12, there's more images of the probe uh, making its way through the bridge of the Enterprise. This is the energy probe, and when the crew realizes that Viger is absorbing Starfleet military and defense secrets from a particular computer console, Mr. Spock attempts to destroy the console with his bare hands. Now, apparently, there was only one computer console through which that information could be accessed. Um, I don't think that's how computers work. I mean, and I think people probably knew that even when this film was made in 79. Uh, let's see, page 13. Uh, when After Lieutenant Ilea is abducted, the bridge needs a new navigator to take her place at the helm. And uh, they summon Chief DeFalco. Now, when I hear the name DeFalco in association with the Marvel comic, I immediately think of Mar longtime Marvel writer and editor Tom DeFalco. I, uh, I've seen the movie uh, several times. I don't recall if the name DeFalco is used in the movie or not. Uh, page 14, uh, Commander Decker keeps advocating that Viger should be attacked. Then Sp Commander Spock keeps pointing out the futility of that. I, I have to just agree with Spock on this one. Uh, Viger clearly has enough power to destroy anything that attacks it. Uh, so the, it seems the better move or a better tactical maneuver or strategic maneuver, whatever you want to, or you want to phrase it, um, is to try to placate this thing, which could crush the enterprise like a bug and perhaps the, all of human existence like a bug. Uh, let's see, because yeah, the enterprise needs to, you know, stay alive to keep feature from hurting earth. Uh, on page 15, there are some interesting visuals of the inside of Viger. And when the film first came out, um, it was hard to find people who actually uh, would say how much they loved the story. Uh, I remember one particular uh, TV commercial at the time about promoting the film. And it was filled with people, you know, like coming out of theater, talking about how much they loved the special effects. Um, the commer I'm talking... The commercial was not filled with people saying how much they loved the film. They loved the effects. They didn't love the film. Um, you know, when uh, uh, Gene Roddenberry made the pilot of The Cage, uh, the, the television network said, hey, it's too cerebral. We want more action. Um, and then when he got a chance to make a film, he makes it more cerebral than most people wanted. And in fact, I think you could probably say the same thing when Gene Roddenberry got the opportunity to do Star Trek The Next Generation. A lot of people say the first season was, uh, it had action, but people, but it also lacked a lot of the, the, the character elements. Uh, and when, in order for most people to get into any type of fiction, you need to be able to identify with the characters. And um, uh, that's why I think both the, the original Star Trek series The original Star Trek series uh, and most of the Star Trek films and uh, most of, well, all the TV series, you know, they had characters with whom the viewers can identify. And that's really what makes it, you know, some of the, the best Star Trek scenes are the ones where the characters Kirk and Spock and McCoy are interacting. Uh, let's see, page 16. The Ilea probe makes clear that she is not Ilea and that Ilea is dead. Decker, however, still seems to have feelings for uh, the woman that he left years before, um, and he somehow transfers those feelings towards the Ilea probe. I don't know. If someone were to kill my loved one and then send a mechanical replacement that looked just like my deceased loved one, I would not transfer those feelings to the killer or its mechanical construct replacement. Uh, page 17. Um, there's more talk here about the how the ILEA probe exactly duplicates every body function, no matter how small. Um, so the ILEA probe is both humanoid, you know, not human, humanoid. Um, remember, ILEA is a Dalton. Um, but it's also mechanical, somehow. 
uh, page 18. Like the ending of the previous issue, this issue closes with a weak cliffhanger. Uh, Mr. Spock uses his uh, Vulcan nerve pinch <laughs> on an Enterprise crew member. Uh, I would think that writer Mar Wolfman could have come up with a more exciting way to pique the reader's curiosity for the final part of the adaptation. Uh, while, uh, you know, he didn't create the overall story or the overall dialogue, uh, he did get to decide how it was broken up over the three issues, and I just think there could have he could have found a, a, a more exciting way. Uh, okay, let's take a break. Uh, I'm going to show the credits. Uh, click like, click subscribe, and then come back here after the credits, and I will talk about Star Trek number three. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter under the handle at Justice Trek, or via email at the Justice Trek at gmail.com. Be sure to include the word the at the beginning of the email address. For research purposes, I rely heavily on dc.fandom.com, memory-alpha.fandom.com, comicfind.gamespot.com, the Grand Comics Database at comics.org, and Mike Foyle's website, Mike's Amazing World of DC Comics at dcindexes.com. The opinions expressed are solely those of the host, and any participants. This podcast is not a commercial enterprise and does not make any money. All copyrights are held by their respective owners. The opening sequence was animated by Craig Smith of Phoenix Studios. The opening music is Dragon Slayer by the Mackay Symphony. The closing music pieces are the Superman theme, composed by John Williams, and the Star Trek theme from the original series, composed by Alexander Courage. Both closing songs are performed by the Superhero Orchestra. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Hey, welcome back. Um, so, you know, I never actually saw the film Star Trek The Motion Picture until the summer of 1980, even though it came out in December of 79. Uh, so I didn't see it in the theater. When I saw it in the summer, it was actually at a drive-in movie. Remember those? Uh, they, I know they, they still have them in some places. Um, and really, drive-in movies are not the best way to appreciate any piece of cinema. Um, but at least then I finally got to read the story. You know, I read issues one and two as they came out. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I didn't read issue number three until I bought it off eBay a couple years ago. Um, uh, so I did get to see the ending of how the story turned out, um, at the movie theater. Uh, let's see. Star Trek number three was published March 4th, 1980 with it by Marvel Comics with a 40 cent U.S. cover price and a May cover date. The story was titled Evolution... Wait, May? I don't think it was May. June. It said right here. Look. June. 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 I gotta talk to the guy who wrote my notes. I'm not... Uh, he, I'm going to have to dock that mistake from his pay. The story was titled Evolutions. It was 18 pages by writer-editor writer, Marv Wolfman, uh, Dave Cochran, pencil artist, Klaus Jensen, ink artist, uh, John Costanza, letterer, Marie Severin, colorist, and Jim Shooter, consulting editor. Uh, this issue is the third part of the adaptation uh, and, thir and third and final part. Uh, as the Enterprise treks through the interior of the massive V'ger vessel, Captain Kirk and Dr. McCoy observe that Commander Decker uh, is trying to share knowledge with the Ilea probe. Meanwhile, Mr. Spock takes one of the ship's environmental suits and a thruster pack and leaves the Enterprise to cruise through the open space inside the V'ger vessel on his own, all while making a recording of his observations. Uh, Captain Kirk then dons a suit and thruster pack of his own to follow Spock, 
but he is soon overwhelmed by several small crystals which begin to smother him, and Spock must use his own phaser to save his captain. The two men then continue their travel inside the Vidru vessel. They soon learn that they are not actually inside a vessel at all, um, but in fact the entire construct is part of the sentient entity known as V'ger. Spock attempts a mind meld, uh, but is quickly overwhelmed into unconsciousness. The Vulcan science officer awakens uh, in the sick bay of the Enterprise. Uh, he tells Captain Kirk that not only did he not learn anything from the mind meld, uh, but that V'ger itself was seeking its own answers from Spock. Uh, Lieutenant Chekhov reports that V'ger is now only three minutes from Earth orbit. The ship's senior officers then return to the bridge where they detect a 20th century style radio transmitting a binary code signal to locate its creator. The ILEA probe then says that since the creator has not replied to V'ger, the entity presumes that humanity must be preventing the creator from responding and therefore must be eliminated. As a human, I'm against that. Um, I like Earth. Some of my favorite people live on Earth. Some of my least favorite people live on Earth. Uh, let's see. After a brief discussion with uh, Commander Spock and Commander Decker, uh, Captain Kirk tells the ILEA probe that it will provide Beecher with the answer to all its questions if the entity withdraws from the Earth. And that if Beecher destroys the Enterprise and destroys humanity, that knowledge that Vidra seeks will be destroyed. The Alia probe agrees to take Kirk and the Enterprise directly to Vidra's central intelligence complex. Meanwhile, Kirk tells Mr. Scott to prepare to destroy the ship on his command to hopefully destroy Vidra if it refuses to leave Earth alone. Uh, Mr. When asked if the ship uh, destruction would do that, Mr. Scott replies that... Um, a matter-antimatter explosion uh, can be very, very, very destructive. When the Enterprise reaches Beecher's in central intelligence core, they find that there is an oxygen and gravity envelope that has formed around the ship. Uh, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Decker, and the ILEA probe climb out onto the hull of the Enterprise and then walk across the saucer section towards the intelligence core. Uh, at the edge of the saucer section, there is a platform leading to the core, um, and the officers quickly surmise that, or they quickly learn that the, that the intelligence core is the 20th century Earth probe known as Voyager 6. The officers quickly surmise that when the Voyager 6 probe was lost in space, it somehow made its way to an intelligent machine planet. The machine planet then gave Voyager the power to fulfill its mission of collecting all data possible and then return to Earth to give that data to its creator. The officers obtain the necessary code from historical records to instruct Voyager that its creator is to, ready to receive its transmission. Commander Decker then manually enters the code, and then Voyager transforms Decker into a new form of life capable of receiving the transmission. Decker chooses to stay behind in the Voyager vessel with the ILEA probe. The remaining officers return to the Enterprise, messages Starfleet of their resolution of the situation, and then Kirk orders that the Enterprise be taken on a shakedown cruise. The End uh, the cover art is by uh, Bob uh, Wyacek, I, I think. Wyacek, it's a W, but sometimes W's have, are pronounced with a V. Um, it's a decent image of the uh, Enterprise, um, kind of a little generic, but uh, uh, you don't often see uh, the Enterprise flying over the Earth. So that, so the, the, the ship image is, is generic, but the location, not so much. And it's actually firing its phasers out into space. Uh, this doesn't take place in the story, so it's really supposed to be more symbolic. Um, page one, the splash page has an image of the Enterprise floating through the Beecher megaship. Uh, page two, 
Um, when I see this scene of Commander Decker trying to communicate with the Adelia probe, I can't help but recall one particular panel from the Mad Magazine parody of the film from uh, Mad Magazine number 216. In that panel, we see Kirk, Spock, and McCoy looking le leeringly. They're a little at Decker and Aaliyah, the Aaliyah probe, through a window. So, you know, you've got like uh, Aaliyah in an exam room and Decker's in there with her. And you don't see them. You just see Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, you know, being really dirty old men going, <laughs> Uh, and McCoy says something along the lines of, uh, he's attempting uh, audio-visual uh, communication by uh, whispering in, the, in her ear. Uh, let's see, page three. I don't understand why Spock thought he had to result to such subterfuge to explore V'ger in person. And of, course, it's certain, of course, it certainly makes no sense for Kirk himself to leave the ship to retrieve Spock. I mean, if... Mr. Spock, Commander Spock, what have you. Uh, if he's out where he shouldn't be, you could communicate with him. You could beam him back. Why would the captain, the most theoretically the most important person on the ship, need to risk himself and, by extension, everyone on board the ship by leaving the ship? I, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, page four, we have more images from the inside of V'ger. I thought artist Dave Cockrum did a very good job of catch, capturing the images from the film. Um, as I mentioned um, in when I covered issue one, I don't know if uh, he had the opportunity to view the entire film before he got to draw it. Um, he obviously must have been provided some photo reference because a lot of the, the drawings were pretty spot on. Um, but um, I don't know how much uh, he got. Let's see, see, page five. Now, as I mentioned last episode, Klaus Janssen's inks were too heavy. Uh, that, I mean, that's his style. You know, he's, he's got those dark, moody inks, but it obscured uh, some of Dave Cockrum's line work. Um, now, I did think that Cockrum and Jan Janssen's uh, collaboration led to some uh, really innovative images in the scenes where Kirk and Spock approached the feature. Uh, page six. When Mr. Spock recovers in the Enterprise's medical bay, uh, he ruminates on how V'ger's planet is populated by living machines uh, that have no delight and no beauty. This is, of course, a parallel to how Spock is trying to purge his own mind from such concepts as delight. Um, the, the, you know, the film and the comic um, kind of open with Mr. Spock on planet Vulcan trying to practice uh, the Vulcan technique of colonar, purging emotions, um, but he, he is unsuccessful partially because of the psychic presence of V'ger in the galaxy. And he, you know, is thinking at this time, I'm sure, of how he may want to rethink that. So, I mean, Mr. Spock is half human. Now, one of the things that they later certainly talk about in uh, future iterations of Star Trek, whether it's, you know, the next generation or uh, any of the films or, or what have you, is Vulcans have emotion. They master their emotions, but they still have them. Um, let's see. Page seven. Uh, Captain Kirk tries to trick V'ger, or at least trick the Ilea probe, by making a fake shipwide announcement. Given how powerful V'ger is, and that it has uh, some level of telepathy, I would imagine that trying to deceive it would be pointless. Uh, page 8. Uh, now that they are less than one half hour from Earth, V'ger has released several large objects that can destroy everything on Earth, and all of Earth's planetary defensive systems have just gone inoperative. Uh, on page nine, we see that Kirk finally realizes that V'ger has the mentality of a child seeking its parent, and realizes that it must be dealt with while keeping that in mind. On page 10, here we get the old ploy. Oh, I got the answers you're looking for. But I'm not going to give them to you. So, 
uh, Kirk will give Beecher the information if he, Beecher promises to leave the Earth alone. Uh, page 11, uh, I love the bit where Kirk tells Scotty to destroy the Enterprise if he doesn't return. It totally makes sense. But I don't, but of course, uh, one of the, the ironies, it's not an irony in the context of this film itself, but just two films later in Star Trek III, Kirk and Scotty do actually destroy the Enterprise. On page 12, uh, there's more on this page with Spock identifying with V'ger. Um, page 13, um, this is the only time uh, I ever remember anyone from the original series actually walking on the hull of the Enterprise let alone walking on it without environmental suits. Uh, page 14, back in 1979, it was a big deal that humans had created a probe that could leave Earth's solar system. I mean, these days it doesn't seem quite as big a deal, but it certainly was at that time. Uh, on page 15, it's weird that the 23rd century Enterprise crew uh, were having to deal with an interface between the 20th century Voyager and the super advanced technology of whatever it was that created V'ger's vessel, or sentient construct, or whatever term you want to use. Page 16. Uh, here, Commander Decker again identifies with the Alia probe more than any human really should. Uh, he decides to forego his human life to bond with the construct in the form of his former lover. Remember, he left Alia. Alia herself wasn't enough for him. But apparently, computer Ilea is enough for Commander Decker. On page 17, now, they talk about the, the birth of a new life form. And I suppose, since the Ilea probe, well, they made it clear that she was designed to mimic all humanoid functions, then in theory, she could get pregnant by Decker, and they could create this new humanoid intellect, mechanical life together. Uh, we don't know if that ever happened, though, because n almost nothing from this film was ever reverenced again in Star Trek. Uh, let's see. And page 18, all's well that ends well. Mr. Spock has learned from Beecher that he does not want to become more like the synthetic civilization that transformed the Earth probe into the menace it became. So... Of course, as, as I mentioned in the, when I covered episode one, there's two ways to look uh, at any adaptation. Um, you can judge it based on the overall story. You did it tell a good story, regardless of the original film. Did it tell a good story? Uh, and then the other part is how well it told the film story. Those are not exactly the same thing. So, for example, uh, if, you, you know, it doesn't take uh, two and a half hours to read the comic, even though it took two and a half hours to watch the film. Um, but so you really have to, to me, you have to look at it and just purely in terms of the comic. Did the comic that with the story we got, those, uh, let's see, say three, 18 pages, 54 pages, um, tell a good story. Um, and uh, yeah, I think writer Wolfman did the best he could with what he was given. Uh, you know, he took the, the their story, their screenplay. He broke that story down into the separate panels of the comic. He, he wrote out the script in the comic, which said, you know, what each scene would look like, which dialogue would appear in each uh, panel. And he uh, would put the captions there. And of course, the captions were the one place where he was uh, really allowed to, to uh, put his own touch on it. Uh, you know, a lot of the times when you would see something happen, um, you know, he would describe what was going on behind it. In the film, they might take two minutes to show what was happening, but since uh, Ryder Wolfman was constrained, he instead would take two sentences to describe it. But all in all, the film, the adaptation really should have been given more pages. I mean, the first Star Wars film adaptation was almost twice as long as, as this uh, motion picture adaptation. And even this second Star Wars film, which came out about six months after uh, this, uh, was still almost twice as long at over 90 pages. You know, the plot was wonky, but, you know, again, Wolfman uh, had to work with what he was given. Um, I mean, he was told, here's this movie. You want to write, do a Star Trek comic? You've got to tell this, this movie's story. 
Um, you know, the notion that this alien intelligence was from Earth originally, uh, but some unknown artificial uh, life, uh, you know, created this, you know, super powerful super probe and, you know, sent it back to Earth and was looking for, you know, the, whoever had created it in the first place or whoever was communicating with it in the first place. That actually was pretty similar to the menace from the film Star Trek for the voyage home, you know, the Save the Whales film. You know, in that film, this giant alien probe was destroying vessels and uh, about to destroy Earth uh, because it couldn't find the whales it was looking for. Uh, so what, not, not its creator, but the whales. I'm pretty sure the whales didn't create that probe. Um, but, um, you know, both films, you know, it was up to Kirk and his crew to save the day. Um, but um, Star Trek Four, of course, even though the plot was kind of derivative, of course, they, they sidetracked most of the action by having by replacing it with, with character interaction. So instead of them flying through the galaxy and flying inside the Vigor mega vessel, um, they went back to San Francisco in 1986 and saved whales. And, you know, um, had some fun interaction with the locals. <laughs> That film, of course, was directed by Leonard Nimoy, who obviously had uh, much more experience with the the cast uh, than uh, the uh, Star Trek motion picture director, Robert Wise. I did think that uh, Marie Severin's coloring was outstanding. Um, John Costanza's lettering uh, was kind of the gold standard of, of comic book letterers, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. I don't think it was the best possible start to Marvel Star Trek run, limited as it was. So, um, if you want uh, good Star Trek comics, don't worry. I'll get to them very soon. Uh, let's, all I'll say about the IDW Star Trek comics at this point is, if you haven't read them and you like Star Trek, you owe it to yourselves to go out and get the new Star Trek series from IDW, the one that premiered in 2022. Um, the uh, uh, trade paperback collection of the first six issues uh, has not yet been released. Um, so if you see it, snatch it up and read it. Uh, your local comic store and our online retailer may have copies of the uh, individuals. And of course, you can always look for digital copies uh, from, uh, I don't know, uh, I, Comixology would probably have it on their app, but I know a lot of comics fans don't like the Comixology app. Um, I, I actually don't mind it. You know, I've got my Kindle, and I think it works fine on the Kindle. Um, you can't actually buy comics on the Comixology app. You have to go to Amazon, buy them there, and then read them on your Kindle for some reason. Uh, that's the way the Comixology app is working these days. But it does work, and I do read that a lot of digital comics that way. But um, I you know, also read a lot of paper comics, too. Just remember, um, the previous episodes are available for your viewing and listening pleasure. Episode 1, where I covered Justice League of America, number 137 from 1976, featuring the very first appearance of Superman in the original Captain Marvel, Shazam!, Episode 2, where I covered Gold Key Star Trek number 1 from 1967, the very first Expanded Universe original Star Trek story. Episode 3, where I covered 1940s All-Star Comics number 3, with the very first appearance of the very first comics super team, the Justice Society of America. Episode 4, where I covered Star Trek number 1 from Marvel 1980. Uh, and episode 5, where I covered The Brave and the Bold, Number 28, from 1959, with the first appearances of Snapper Carr, Star of the Conqueror, and the Justice League of America. Uh, now, I was invited to be part of the this year's J.L. May crossover. And uh, the issue I picked last uh, September, when I was first offered... Uh, was issue nine because it has Blackhawk, one of my all-time favorite comic book characters. Uh, and then it was recently decided that they probably want to tie in the issue number to the day of release. So in other words, you know, issue one would come out on the 1st of May, issue nine would come out on the 9th of May, issue 30 would come out on the 30th of May, issue 35 would come out on the 35th of May, and so on and so on. 
Um, so issue nine would normally be my Trek Tuesday. So we won't be doing Trek Tuesday next week. And our next episode of Justice Trek, instead of covering Justice League and Justice Society, will kind of be my, my prep uh, for uh, that issue of uh, The Brave and the Bold, the 2007, 2008 version of Brave and the Bold. Uh, so in our very next episode of Justice Trek, I am going to be covering not one, but two comic book stories, uh, both related to Blackhawk. Uh, I'll be covering the very first Black Hawk story ever from 1941's Military Comics number one. And if you like the team of Marv Wolfman and Dave Cockrum in the year 1980, well, I've got another Marv Wolfman and Dave Cockrum 1980 story for you in our next episode. In that one, Black Hawk teams up with Batman. From the Brave and the Bold, number 167. That is going to be a very, very good story. And then if you haven't had a chance to read it, um, well, you've got uh, about four days now. So get to it. Stop, stop. Okay, three days. Uh, two, two. Oh, time's a wasting. Better see if you can track down that story. Or you can just listen to me tell you all about it. Either way, so next episode, Military Comics number one. From 1941 and the brave and the bold number 167 from 1980 and then the following week i'll be covering the brave and the bold number nine from 2008 and after that um i'll get back on the normal justice trek stuff and it'll actually be not justice trek not trek justice but it'll be the, my very first crisis trek episode where i journey through Crisis on Infinite Earths. And we'll be talking about 1978's Showcase number 100, the comic book that inspired Marv Wolfman to write The Crisis. If not for Showcase number 100, there literally may never have been a Crisis on Infinite Earths. So following that episode, so we're getting two weeks out, on Trek Tuesday, I will be covering Star Trek. You know, we just covered, um, you know, last uh, Star Trek Tuesday, uh, we covered uh, Star Trek number one. Uh, today, we covered Star Trek number two and Star Trek number three. And then on the next Trek Tuesday in two weeks, we'll be covering Star Trek number four. Hundred from IDW, published last year, 2022. There's some really good stuff in IDW Star Trek number 400. From 2022 and i really uh am looking forward to talking about it with you so i uh, hope i've piqued your interest for uh, future episodes ah i ah, see i used the, the peaked interest again that i mentioned earlier with you know the the, the comic not piquing readers interest enough for the next episode so i'm trying to, to peak interest i'm a peaker <laughs> okay uh, uh click like <laughs> please click subscribe and Please keep on justice trekking. So uh, I did think, as I mentioned in the previous uh, installment, that uh, I thought Marie Severin's coloring was outstanding. Uh, John Costanza, pardon me. Hey, 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 hey!